Becoming homeless in 2025 is a lot more common than you might think. A lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck currently and that's not really a sustainable life if something like an injury or sickness comes up either to you, your parents, your pet, somebody. And through my nonprofit, the majority of people that I've come across have had some kind of thing just pop up in their life suddenly and they couldn't afford rent one day and then they were out on the streets. It can really happen that fast. And a lot of the times, most people aren't comfortable being outside. Camping wasn't a part of their life, or they just never really got exposed to it very often growing up. In this video, I'm going to be covering the top five plants that I recommend to people to learn if they become homeless, just so that you can guaranteed have something fresh to eat, and you also have a little bit of medicine growing around you. Now, while hospitals do still have their place and emergency care is still extremely critical, many homeless people don't really feel like they have access to or are even taken seriously whenever they go in for any chronic conditions. A lot of the times, these staffs at these hospitals are trained and told specifically to just get you in and out as fast as possible if you're a homeless person. And while that might seem good for the downside of the hospital, it really does make these people feel like they're not heard and not really valued anymore. The first plant I want to go over is called mullen, or verbascum thapsus, and this one is considered highly invasive in the United States, so much so that it's actually technically illegal to sell its seeds, although I have seen them on Etsy, so I'm sure it's not enforced very much. This one is native to Ireland and was used heavily in Celtic and Druidic traditional medicine for respiratory ailments. Mullen starts out as a basil rosette, which just means that it's really low to the ground and it kind of looks like a whorl of leaves. The second year it gets really tall, and this is actually a pretty short one, but I have seen some that are up to five to six feet tall, so they can get pretty big. The flower on top was traditionally used to help with ear infections when made into an oil extract, which is just soaking the flower in olive oil or coconut oil, just some kind of carrier oil. I have personally found great success with this technique in treating ear infections on myself and my cats because mullen is also safe for dogs and cats to use if they have upper respiratory problems. Like one of my cats, he has seasonal allergies, so I give him stinging nettle, which is safe for cats, and mullen, which is safe for cats, so that he can help open up his lungs and he doesn't have any of his sneezing fits like he used to. It can be used to make tea, tinctures, or salves, though I have found that as a tea it generally works best, and I have actually heard of some people using it as a steam inhalation alongside things like juniper to really help clear out the lungs in case of an upper respiratory infection. The second plant I want to go over is called plantain, or plantago, and it's a lot lower lying to the ground except for its tall flower stalks that form later in the season. Plantain was traditionally used to help with ailments of the foot, and it's really good for helping pain and bug bites. Native Americans also used plantain in their snake bite poultices to help draw out and deactivate poison. And actually there has been some studies on plantain's ability to help deactivate certain types of venom from venomous snakes. Now that was not done on snakes of North America, as the funding is not there for it unfortunately, but traditional uses do generally point us in the right direction. While the first plant I talked about is not necessarily considered edible just because of the fuzziness of its leaves, but plantain is actually one of my, my personal favorite additions to salads to add a lot of protein and just a lot of pain-killing effects. It is a little bit bitter because of this, but it can also be cooked with, which takes the bitterness completely away. The third plant I want to go over is called yarrow, or Achillea millifolium, named after the Greek hero Achilles because he was said to use it on himself and his soldiers' wounds to help stop bleeding. Yarrow is one of the most researched plants that we have actually in our arsenal, and we humans have been using it for thousands of years to help with any internal or external wounds. This one can be found growing widely around the United States in pretty much all types of soils. It's incredibly hardy and actually can be found on all seven continents, except for Antarctica, of course. Yarrow is one of my personal favorite plants to teach homeless communities just because of how important this plant used to be to humanity. So if you ever come across yarrow, remember that it has very fine feathery leaves, hairy stems, and a five petal white flower. The fourth plant I want to go over is lamb's ear, or Stachys byzantana, and I've had a lot of luck teaching homeless people how to use this one as an antiseptic bandage, which is one of its primary traditional uses. 
you can see that it has a big broad square stem which means that it's in the mint family and it also has opposite leaves which is also characteristic of the mint family as well. Lamb's ear is not native to the United States but it can be found actually pretty commonly just because it's grown as an ornamental plant for decoration like it is actually in this one that I'm showing you right now. Although because it's an ornamental plant, it is really important to remember to make sure that you're not picking from an area that's been sprayed with pesticides because that can harm you in indirect ways. Lamb's ear relies on compounds like cubanol and linalool to give it its antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory abilities. Lamb's ear was used traditionally to help break colds and flus, specifically when they're accompanied by fevers and chills. While its leaf is technically edible, it's not necessarily one of my favorites because it has kind of a weird mouthfeel, especially if you eat it raw. But it can be blanched and cooked with, especially as a pot herb to add to soups if you need to add nutrition into your meal. Typically, I would recommend making it into a tea, and if you want to and you have an eye problem or you need an eye wash, this is one of my personal favorites that I have had experiences with, using it as an eye wash for myself and my cats because once again, Lamb's ear is also safe for dogs and cats as well. The last plant I want to go over are the clovers. So this includes red clover, Trifolium pratense, white clover or Trifolium repens, and sweet clover or Metolius officinalis. So these are one of my favorite ones to teach people just because they can literally be found everywhere. And the clovers are in the pea family so they do have these nice purple kind of conical shaped flowers that are in tight bunches. Some people do get it confused for plants like crown vetch, although their leaves are completely different and the flowers do look a little bit similar. Red clover is an incredible source of food that can be found pretty much growing all around the United States. It's one of my favorite to teach people just because it really does support your body in many ways that most modern vegetables don't even. Red clover has something called folates and it's really hot in iron, which are really supporting to the bones and blood health. One of my favorite ways to consume it is as a tea, but you can eat the tops and they're relatively sweet on red clover. White clover they don't really taste like much and sweet clover they don't really taste like much. Both red and white clover can be used interchangeably as food, but generally red clover is considered to be more medicinal and is used for that instead. Red clover can be identified by its three leaves or trifolium and it's usually found growing in pastures which is what pratense means in Latin. And the scientific name for white clover just means that it's trifolium, three leaves, and repens just means low-lying to the ground. If you learned something from this video, then make sure you're subscribed and hit that like button because I'll be posting on here weekly going over medicinal and edible plants in the wild that homeless individuals specifically can really benefit from. Thank you for watching and happy foraging.